to his work. The main body of the report should include a section on public reaction to President Kennedy's assassinations, with particular reference to suspicions, allegations, rumors, and theories that have persisted. And we should ha this should be done briefly by reference to the basic facts developed. These public fears and rumors should be dispelled positively by considering and disposing of them rather than negatively ignoring them. They are part of the historical context of the event just as a century of myth-making since Lincoln's assassination. Failure of the Commission to destroy these myths while they are still in their infancy may permit them to persist as long as they have the Lincoln myths. Now, this is Alfred Goldberg, historian for the Warren Report. There was a failure to dispel these myths because anybody picking up the book and comparing it to this testimony and the documents could kindle forever the story that there was a conspiracy because the evidence just isn't there that they tried to line it up and they backed up with a lot of probabilities. And I brought in, Gloria, a letter dated May the 14th. This is from the National Archives by Robert Green from Voice of America. There were two organizations, Voice of America and the United States Information Agency, both lead closely aligned with the CIA and this hidden government. Uh, we know the role they take in the United States. And they are to go over there all over the world, and also in this country they influence the minds. And the third method of making you believe um, that there was a conspiracy, in addition to the early coverage and the commission being prestigious, was to control your heads about the information you were about to receive. So in May of 1964, the Voice of America wrote a letter to the commission giving its suggestions on how to control the heads when the Warren Report came out. And this is the way it reads. When the report is issued, its reception will depend upon two factors, the substance of the report itself and the credibility accorded to the commission. And the degree of credibility must be directly, must directly determine the influence of the report. In other words, end quote one minute, the report isn't going to stand alone, the substance. The credibility is going to determine the influence of the report. The letter goes on. Since the foreign and some domestic press have questioned this credibility, and since the public effect of the report is, in a true mathematical sense, a function of its credibility, I would offer the following. The public at this moment is an unfocused audience with regard to the commission. Um, let me get off the quote a minute to say that the American people had no opinion one way or the other. They were waiting for the document to come in. And they had no way. They felt there were discrepancies in the evidence, the rifle and so forth, coming out in the news media. But they didn't have a firm opinion, so they're waiting. So what Mr. Green is saying is the public is an unfocused, he calls it an unfocused, audience with regard to the commission. But when the commission speaks for the first time, world attention will suddenly focus upon it. And whatever the commission says at that point will be important news and will command wide coverage. Every detail becomes feature editorial. The sudden focusing of audience attention can be used to advantage. I suggest that a preface to that report be issued some days in advance, since the effect of the report is a function of its credibility. This preface to be concerned with credibility, thereby serving a dual function, focusing world attention at the same time reinforcing credibility. <laughs> I have to end the quote for a few laughs because when we talk about a credibility gap with <laughs> Lyndon Johnson, I mean, this is to get, get your face on the screen. They were going to have television, you know, rehashing the Warren thing report and, um, confirming that Oswald's assassin the day the report came out. But the whole thing is to get your mind on the report and focus the world attention and reinforce your credibility. The content of the preface and the eminence of the report shouldn't deal with the findings of the commission, he says, but with the procedures the commission uses, like the number of witnesses, their thorough search for detail, and the reality which you verbalized to me. It wasn't put into writing. The advantage of this procedure, it seems to me, is that the credibility of the commission is the big story. Credibility, which is the source of speculation, 
is handled head on at the outset. It is given maximum publicity because it is the first utterance of the commission. And such a preface will focus the audience and may well lay down the tone the press is going to take for what is to come. Now, your choices, he says, before the commission are limited. Number one, you can issue your report without any advanced preface. Or, B, ignore the attack on the credibility of the report if they are made after the report is once issued. And C, reinforce the credibility of the commission after the issuance of the report. And this is what, and I have to end the quote here, this is what the Warren Commission and the people in Washington did afterwards, Lyndon Johnson, and this is what Richard Nixon did after the death of Robert Kennedy with all the suits coming in and the discrepancies in the evidence. Um, in the John Kennedy murder, they issued the report, but they gave the advance preface. They ignore the tax on the credibility, and they reaffirm the credibility of the commission. You wouldn't go against this chief justice and this prestigious commission. And then they said the fourth suggestion was use the preface approach and give it high publicity as the commission's first utterance. Now that is from Voice of America. United States Information Agency had some more suggestions. This is in July 13th. They were to get in all the people from the newsmen from 65 countries, 515 50 newsmen from 65 countries, and they would get a briefing at their center in New York City. And they would be effective. They would have another briefing in Washington. And a representative of the commission should be available when the Warren Report is released. And they want wide publicity abroad. And Mr. Rankin is to send people abroad, John J. McClain and Alan Dulles are to go to abroad, too, and push the Warren Report. July 20th, 1964, U.S. Information Agency wrote to Mr. Rankin, first, set the guidance materials to enable our television service to go ahead on realistic planning of our proposed documentary, and it will be seen by only three individuals, senior officers of this agency, top secret, the director of our television service, the production chief, the policy chief. No other officers will be here. They're to make a movie showing how good the Warren Report is. No one else will have access to to this guidance except on a need-to-know basis with your concurrence. He said, remember how we talked there's about... There's need-to-know again. There's need. <laughs> remember we said on the CIA, this is going to be a movie to t send all over the world to 65 countries, and it's to confirm the Warren Report. But it's a top-secret meeting. It's a very prestigious commission that's worked all these months with, you know, 15, 552 witnesses and 36,000 exhibits. But how they're going to sell the Warren Report is going to be top secret for U.S. Information Agency. Now, he goes on in the letter. This is Carl Rowan, Carl T. Rowan, Director for United States Information Agency. I also hope the Chief Justice will find it possible to hold a press conference. In my judgment, the benefit of a press conference will be tremendous, since to refuse the press, meet the press, will lend support to allegations that the truth has been shoved under the rug and is being kept there. So as far as this agency's responsibility is concerned, a wide open press conference would immensely strengthen the prospect of gaining a respectful reception of the report abroad. There was as much time spent on how to make the report acceptable as there was in just bringing up the problems in the report. They, they really, none of them were solved in, in trying to handle this murder. There's another letter here from September 30th. This is just before the Warren Report came out from Alfred Goldberg, the same historian, to Lee J. Rankin, who was um, the head attorney for the Warren Commission. And he was wondering, the Department of State inquired about the visit to Europe of Mr. McCloy, John J. McCloy, and Alan Dulles. The embassy in Paris is apparently confused by what seems to be an overlapping visit for the same purpose. They're both going off to Europe and um, tell you how good the Warren Report is. Now, what happens when the pressure is put out and movies are sent to all these countries and U.S. information services will give to the American movie companies and the television screen and all over the world? Here are the headlines. I went to my study where I've kept news articles since 1963, Gloria, since November 63. And I'm going to read you about 20 headlines, various headlines, that came out in three days following the assassination. On September the 28th, 
Uh, these are the headlines from, I have papers from all over the country, but this is the way some of them read. London Press acclaims report. The next one is the work of one unhappy man. Nothing withheld from the Warren Report. Warren Commission Report, LA Times in the editorial said, only the sick irrational could take issue. Bob Considine had a large article, great document. There was another one that was ghastly. Oswald had wanted to kill since the age of 15. This didn't show up anywhere in the Warren Report at all. Not a thread of truth to this. And we'll read, you know, other times. In the Marines, he wrote in his score. He had, at the rifle range, the group that he was in didn't do any shooting because they were in the secret, uh, he had top secret clearance in radar. And Lee Harvey Oswald wrote in his score because he only had to shoot once a year. If he was in the Marines three times, he, he wrote in his own score. And he had absolutely no interest in weapons and was never seen with a weapon ever in his life. So uh, this is, he wanted to kill since the age of 15. Another one said, no basis for questioning the Warren Commission. That's from the great liberal, Walter Lippmann. Another one, Oswald's hunger for attention, life of discontent. September 30th headlines, Warren report accepted, European press reaction, London, Paris, Denmark accepted. Warren report dispels the rumors. That's an editorial in San Francisco Chronicle. Ruby alone in Oswald slang, is Oswald slang. Oswald wasn't a foreign agent. There's another one. Warren verdict. Oswald alone. All that is known, told by the Warren Commission. Live magazine, October the 2nd, has a cover with a conclusion. And it's got four inside the pages. If you look up October 2nd issue, 1964, they have four top leads on four successive pages, which read, One Rival, One Rifleman. Another one, Mother's Myth. Oswald, a paid U.S. agent. Another one, nailing rumors of a conspiracy. And then they have a large picture of the commission sitting at a table. The prestigious commission are all photographed in life. Time magazine has a cover, October the 2nd, with a picture of Oswald in the title, No Conspiracy, Domestic or Foreign. Los Angeles Times book review by Robert Kirsch says, The Warren Report is a masterpiece. Now, I read you just a few of the headlines among my collection, and this is the way it runs, that all the rumors you see are put down. The whole emphasis was not on showing where the gun was purchased or any of the actual evidence in the murder. The whole emphasis is the rumors are put down. The orders that I have from their letters in May, June, July, and August on how they're going to handle it. This is the way it was handled. See? Uh, why would they go to so much trouble, I wonder, May, if uh, uh, to um, make this uh, acceptable if they didn't have some some grave doubts about its credibility? Well, that's that's the point. If they didn't have grave doubts about their credibility, they wouldn't have to uh, go into that at all. Maybe in the second half of the show I should read some. I brought in some documents which we may or may not have time for. Maybe for the second half of the show, I'll just read those. May, to back up may the brought in a box that is <laughs> a, a huge box full of documents. We couldn't even start to cover well, we were everything going, that you brought. We were going, I was going to talk the first uh, half hour on why do people have such a block to accepting the fact of a conspiracy. And I do hope that as time goes on, I can open up people's minds if they listen every week and make a point or really try to and make a note when the show is over, write down the hour and put on your icebox at the dinner hour and try to remember each week because you can't get it in one hour. And I don't want you to agree with me. I've said this before. I don't want you to agree with me, but you don't have a right to disagree unless you fall for a few weeks because you can't get eight, week, eight, eight years' work into one, one any program. one hour. But the people who've been playing the tapes over for 20 weeks, they can see a thing much more clearly, you know, and invite friends in and listen to the, some of the tapes. It's easier. I'll take a moment. You're listening to Dialogue Assassination with Mae Bressel. This is KLRB Carmel. Well, May, uh, we're continuing on now. I see that you've brought a lot of documents to back up uh, the things that you've been telling us. Uh, many people have talked to me, and I've talked to a number of people on the, f on the phone that have called in about the programs. And I had an interesting call last week. A man said, 
it's the first time he had heard the program and that he was very much impressed by what you